Yes, there are seats here. Um, we should get started because we already it makes past the time. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know if this is your uh, ever first lecture in second year or you guys have a lecture in the morning. Um, but today's H4 is maybe your kind of real first programming course in the university. I know that every one of you had already had a Python course in the first year. Um, but uh, I usually leverage the first le lecture of 2SH4 uh, to, in fact, introduce uh, what is computer engineering. So why do I do so? For a couple of reasons. The first one is, if you are a comprehensive student, it's very important to understand really what is the full picture, right? So usually if you stay very focused in the narrow, for example, programming, or later on if you take a hardware course, then, well, the hardware of the topic, and you don't get the big picture of the full system, uh, you, you don't really get it, right? So you should be able to see the big picture to be able to understand really what are we doing here, right? Uh, but then the question comes, is this only for comp bench students? Well, the answer is no, right? Because, well, taking a programming course means you are into, well, computers, right? And you need to understand that it's just much more than really writing a low level program or writing a, a very high level Python or Java or C program, right? Uh, you need to understand the essence of really what is going on behind the scene. And I would maybe claim a little bit that this course is different in that sense, is anyone can learn programming of their own, uh, but we are teaching programming as, uh, as part of an engineering program, uh, which means you by taking this course, intending to be not necessarily a software engineer, but at least taking it from an engineering perspective, should be completely different than taking it from well, just a hobby perspective or someone that knows how to write code. And we will see in different occasions why there is a big difference between both. Okay? So these are the couple of reasons why I really like to, to start the first lecture with what is the big picture here, right? What are we doing? What was H is part of? And how this might align with other courses that more or less you will take as part of your degree. Good. Um, I feel pain with those that, well, this is one hour, right? So so there are empty seats here. I know it's a bit crowded, but uh, you guys can have a seat. Okay. So in this slide, you see what I call the full system stack. Uh, what do I mean by this? So as part of your computer, basically interacting with your laptop, there is a full stack that you don't really see, right? And here I mean by the word full stack different than what web developers, for example, call a full stack developer, right? I really mean the full stack of the computing system, not just the full stack of the web, right? So what is this full stack? So usually you only see, uh, well, more or less the first layer here, which is the application layer. For example, opening Chrome or Teams or I don't know, like um, Zoom or any other application, this is the application that is running on top of this stack, right? But to be able really to function correctly, well, everything has to run seemingly. Otherwise, well, in fact, you will have problems, right? Even if you don't see the root cause of this problem. So to see that, well, there is a bunch of layers of software uh, beyond the application, even before you go to the hardware. There is the operating system. Can you give me an example of an operating system you guys have been using? Windows. Windows is one. Uh, another one? Mac OS. Mac OS, which is basically the Apple uh, counterpart. Yeah. Linux, definitely, for open source guys. What else? Android, right? If you have your uh, Android phone or iOS for basically the counterpart of Mac for mobile devices, right? So there are, we can have multiple operating systems. The most common ones we have already mentioned. Uh, but the main kind of functionality, well, from, from the perspective of a user, there are separate courses for OS, but as a user, what do you need from an operating system? Simply, you need it to run your programs, right? In an efficient way, in uh, maybe less resource way, because if you, have, if you don't have a very powerful laptop, uh, then maybe your operating system should take care of your resources, right? Running applications in an effective and uh, efficient way, right? Uh, so we have the operating system, and then the operating system 
uh, has multiple what we call kernels, multiple jobs of the operating system. And different operating systems differ in how they implement them. For example, we have what we call device drivers here. What does this mean? Sorry. So device driver, well, does anyone know what is a device driver in an operating system? Yeah, go ahead. For example, yeah, that's that's one example. Uh, I don't know if, if you are old enough, but maybe 10 years ago, you used to have a CD-ROM with any kind of device you get, even if it's a mouse or a keyboard, that you have to plug in, you have to set up your driver such that the operating system get to recognize it, right? Uh, have you ever, like, did, did you ever see that? Yeah, not necessarily a CD-ROM, but maybe in a USB or you have to download something from, from a, a website, right? Right now, most operating systems move to a way that is better integrable in the way that, well, whatever the device is, by default, it will recognize it from the software in the background. So you don't have to care about it, right? But previously, you had to set up drivers. Driver is nothing other than just a simple software that has to interact with the new hardware that you attach it to your system. Good? This is what we call device drivers. You will have one for USBs, as your friend said. We have ones for uh, maybe monitors, screens. We have ones for well, GPUs, if you deal with your GPU as an, an I.O. card. Uh, we have, uh, what else, like uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Ethernet, uh, well, uh, what, what we call the NIC uh, IP that you basically is connected also to your, uh, maybe not necessarily in modern laptops, but maybe in your desktop, where you have like a wired Ethernet uh, internet connection, right? There are multiple devices that you need to interact with, right? And this is what the device driver is doing. Then we have a scheduler. Uh, well, scheduler basically runs multiple tasks. One in my laptop, I have hundreds of things are being open. I'm not a very efficient user, so I have Chrome, I have PowerPoint, I have Zoom, I have Teams, I have, I have, I have. Right? So there are multiple things that are running. If all of them are running well in the same time, whether I'm using them or not, that's a bad resource utilization. It will eat up my my battery, and also I need to context switch between them in an efficient way. So you must have a scheduler in the background that does this, right? Uh, that schedules your tasks based on the importance, based on priority, based on whether you're using them or not, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have loaders that basically, uh, well, takes the one when, for example, you click the, the Chrome uh, uh, icon, it loads the software into your memory to be able to use it, right? This is what's called loader. Um, and then in the side of this, well, this is the full list of an operating system stuff. Again, it's not the focus of this course. Usually operating system courses cover this in, in a bit of a detail. Uh, but effectively, you need to understand this and you need to understand how it interacts with your source code. For example, to write an efficient software that utilizes certain operating systems, right? So some of the most famous uh, software, in fact, is rewritten to address different operating systems. Well, think of Chrome, for example. Chrome for mobile phones is different than Chrome really for uh, laptops. And the reason is, well, different resources, different requirements, different constraints, and you have to take care of them, right? Uh, and then, well, another kind of line of things away from a uh, breathing system and, and application, there is the compiler, right? Uh, does anyone know what is a compiler or what does it do? Just in a very high level, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Yes, this is, the, from a user perspective, this is the main functionality for a compiler. We write soft, like software. In, in, in 2SH, we write either C or C++ source code, right? We need to compile it to be able to run it. What do we mean by compile? You need to take your F statements for loops, the source code, and convert this into something that the machine will be able to execute, right? Uh, and well, compilers really affect much what programming language to choose. Uh, in two years ago, we used to teach to SH as C and Java, where both are completely different kind of mindsets from the compiler point of view. C uh, is a compiled language, while Java or Python, for example, in first year, is an interpreted like what? Well, Java is something in between because it runs in a Java virtual machine. But think of Py uh, Python, for example. Uh, in Python, it's an interpreted language. What does this mean? So in fact, there is no source code and binary. What happens is that you have your uh, source code, and then when you want to run your program, the interpreter on the fly uh, translates your source code into what can be executed. What, what do I say? What do I mean by on the fly? It's just a step while you are executing. This makes it convenient, it makes it maybe uh, for most scripting languages, um, operating system independent, for example, but it makes it very slow, right? So Python, for example, or Perl or shell scripts, 
uh, scripting languages in general, what we call interpreted languages, they are very slow in terms of running time. On the other hand, for C, which is a combined language, I know that what I'm saying is a lot, right? So don't panic, don't worry. I'm just giving you a bunch of kind of like big scheme of things so that later on you're able to connect the dots, right? Uh, so C is a combined language and we would have separate set of slides for this. What it means, as your friend said, I, I write my source code before being able to uh, run it or execute it. I need Ray to transform it into a binary and then this binary can give to anyone as far as they really have a, a, the, the same ISA or the same instruction set. We will come into this as well. Uh, they are able to run my binary. Good. So there are two separate things and I only run the binary. Good. Uh, I don't know if you already use MATLAB in first year, but you'll be using MATLAB a lot, no matter what is your major, right? And MATLAB is an interpreted kind of language because again, there is no binary. You just write your program, you run, it runs, right? Because just there is an interpreter in the background, which is part of the software that handles this for you on the fly. Again, this makes MATLAB convenient, but it makes it very, very slow, right? Good. So all what we discussed right now is just the software layer. Is there any question? I know that there might be details that I'm missing. Again, every one of this is really a separate course. For compilers, sometimes even two courses. Operating systems also might be two courses. And uh, well, applications is, well, this stream of programming courses you will be taking to SH, to SI, uh, and others. Uh, so each one of this is a separate course. But the big picture is, I have my application. Well, I develop it. So you, you have to take uh, software development or software engineering courses, and then, you need to take a compiler course to know how to efficiently map your source code into the binary that fits the hardware. And then you need to take an operating system course to, need to, to know how to handle multiple applications that you might have wrote already into SH or SI in, uh, in a machine, in your laptop or your desktop. Good. Is there any question? Does this make sense? Okay, so this is the software layer. I didn't even talk about what is the hardware you are using. You might be using your laptop, you might be using your mobile phone, you might be using a desktop machine, a server, uh, maybe an IoT device, a smart wearable, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, but one question that might kind of interest you is how does the hardware and the software interact together? So I have my application, for example, and I want to run. How does really the hardware know that this application is adding two numbers, for example, or multiplying something or doing a for loop, achieving a certain purpose, right? Uh, and to answer this question, there must be a contract, right? Think of the hardware and the software as two separate domains, two separate wallets. They need to talk to each other. Well, to be able to talk to each other, you must have a common language or a common contract that you everyone has to adhere to. And this contract is called the instruction set architecture, right? So this is the ISA layer that I have here. And this is key in all really computer engineering, computer science, related uh, knowledge, whether it's programming or hardware or architecture or organization, doesn't really matter in various systems, whatever it is, because this ISA layer is what enables software engineers to not, well, to some extent, not care at all about what is the hardware and to enable hardware engineers or architects to not care about, well, the exact things about the software. Once we agree into an interface, into a contract, we are good. Do whatever you want. I will do whatever I want as far as we adhere to the terms of that contract. Good. So this is the instruction set. What is an instruction set? I mean, there is a course that you are, should be currently taking this semester as well, which is 2DI, right? The digital design course. As part of that course, you will learn about what is an assembly language, right? Uh, we will also touch a little bit on this in, in uh, 2SH, because we have the source code that we write in C, for example. We have to assemble it well. Your friend said about a combiner that it takes you from a source code to the binary. But in fact, there are intermediate steps. There is a source code, there's an assembler that gives you the assembly language, and then this assembly language is get, getting translated into the binary zeros and ones that the machine understands. Good. Why right now I'm making this distinction or making this intermediate layer of assembly language? Because assembly language is the actual materialization of the ISA for that layer, right? What does it mean really to have an add instruction, add R1, R2, R3, which means add two numbers, put them in as like a different destination, uh, this is being translated into a certain number of bits. These bits are already known by the hardware. So once I see these bits, it means to me execute the addition into these kind of inputs and put the output in the, this destination, right? So these are instructions. That's why they're called instructions because you instruct the hardware what to do. Good. 
And this ISA is the interface between, for example, 2SI, 2SH, and other programming courses, including the Python first year course, and any hardware course you would take, right? Because this hardware would be executing the software. How does it know it? By that thing, right? Good. So now ISA takes us from the software layer to the hardware layer, or from the software wallet to the hardware wallet. What do we have in the hardware? Well, any hardware course would rely or would cover uh, some part of this knowledge. For example, well, computer architecture course or computer organization course. This is what we have here as part of the processor, memory, or I.O. system. Uh, again, an embedded system course covers the three. And then through the processor, you would have to design your processor, right? So you have to write the circuitry uh, or design the circuitry that composes the processor, which in fact you would be doing in one of the computer organization courses, right? Uh, and then you would go all the way down, for example, if in edge uh, uh, in, in physics, uh, they cover more the physical layer of the design of the circuitry, which is the MOSFET transistors. I don't know if you guys hear this term from your high school, but simply these are the very small kind of uh, unit or building block of any hardware circuitry, right? The transistor. So this is what we call the physical IC layout design layer. So let's see some, some of these things because it might not be very clear. So I start from a source code, which is the program I'm writing here. We will do a lot of 2SH here. Um, and then I need to compile it using a compiler uh, that most too commonly compiles GCC, which we'll be using, and there's LLVM as well, which is open source. Then here we have an executable that should run on top of an operating system, right? Well, we have multiple operating systems. We already mentioned this. And then the operating system loads your program into the memory, start reading the bits, the zeros and ones. How do I know really what these zeros and ones mean from the instruction set layer? Here I'm mentioning some of the instructions or uh, ISAs. For example, if you have an Intel machine, uh, they have what we call the x86 instruction set, right? If you are, well, in your mobile phone, most likely whether it's Apple or, or, uh, or Android, it doesn't really matter. We have an ARM instruction set there. Uh, well, we used to have uh, Sun, Spark, uh, or even also uh, there is the Power PC from IBM. There are multiple kind of contracts based on what machine you are using. The most commonly uh, used two ones is x86 and ARM. ARM is mainly dominant in mobile phones and embedded systems, while x86 is dominant in well laptops, um, desktops, as well as servers. Good. So I, I translate my binary into something that I can execute and the actual hardware executes it. So here what I'm showing is the layout of, um, this is Intel i7, which you might have on your laptop, uh, where it composes of multiple cores and then, well, memories, IOs, and well, memory controllers, etc. right? So this is the actual layout of your, uh, your processor design. Good. And then, well, first of all, before going into complexity, does this make any sense to you? Is that flow clear? Do you have questions? The important thing about this flow is, 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 is just beyond 2SH, beyond programming, right? If anyone is interested in computers in general, it's good to understand what's really happened, right? From the moment that you write a single line of code to the moment that it really executes in the hardware, right? So if you understand the big picture, that's good because you can relate everything into it. Uh, if you missed anything or you are not very clear, so uh, I usually ask multiple times during the lecture if you have questions. So every 10 minutes, you will, you will have a chance to ask. Yeah, yeah, I will do that. I usually do them before. Uh, and I will come into all the logistics after I give this introduction. Hopefully we have some time. Uh, but yeah, I will post them. OK, so. Well, things are not as easy as it might seem. It's not really a one way flow because, for example, as I said before, the compiler need to understand what operating system and what instruction set you are compiling for. Uh, but this is usually covered in a little bit of a detail in a compiler course, right? But now I want to, after after discussing this flow, I want to show you really some of the courses or some of the fields that you might be interested in. Where do they lie really in, in this full picture, right? Before going into, well, I started from the C, C++ layer here, but in fact, before this, you need to design or architect an, a solution, an algorithm, right? For example, you work for a software company, a client comes to you, 
they will not tell you, please write a full loop for me or an if statement for me, right? They will tell you, I have this problem. For example, well, I'm a big supply chain company. I won't write software to track and manage my supply, right? Or my inventory. So they, they will describe the problem for you in a very high level language, right? It, you as a software architect would be, the rule is to take these requirements from the bare language, right? Maybe it's not very clear, it's vague, it's not very well specified. And then you need to translate it into an actual algorithm, well, taking into account all the considerations and constraints. Good. So this is usually what we call algorithms, and this is covered more in 2SI later on and subsequent courses. But the main idea is before even writing a single line of code, you would have to think of what is the solution, right? And this is one big difference between being a real software engineer or write an efficient code as a, an engineer in general from being really a, a hobby that's just really writing uh, any software development for, for a problem, right? You don't really have to go ahead and start writing while you don't have the solution ready in your mind, right? You should first visualize it, know the ins and outs, usually write a flow chart, write a specification, and then later on start coding, right? And this is a methodology that we have to follow throughout the course, right? For example, in the exam, one advice would be, don't just jump into the solution, visualize it first in mind. I don't mind really you give me a flow chart first or give me your general solution, even in bare language, because this tells me that you understand what is going on. Even if you do a mistake in the code, okay, that's completely okay, right? As far as you architected the correct solution. Good. So in, in the algorithms circle, we have well, AI courses, machine learning courses, algorithms, software engineering in general. And then in uh, in the programming side of things, uh, we have programming courses like 2SH. This is exactly where we have 2SH. And the software development courses in general. I told you that this is already covered in some of the compiler courses, including construction optimization. This is operating system courses. And this is usually computer organization, computer architecture courses, right? So through the computer architecture, we have some more detail. Um, I might just leave it for now because uh, I want to cover some of the logistics of the course. But if you are interested on understanding, we stopped, if we go back to our uh, full stack layer, in fact, we stopped here, right? In this yellow thing, processor, memory, I.O. But I told you that you have to design the circuitry that in fact composes the processor, which you will be doing in, uh, you'll be doing in a computer organization course, computer architecture course. But here's, there is some visualization there. So maybe the one minute hint is, for example, if I take a core, it composes of an execution unit, an ALU, right? Arithmetic logic unit that we'll be designing. And then this arithmetic logic unit composes of multiple NAND and gates, right? You guys know what is a gate, right? Is that correct? Is there anyone that doesn't know what is really a, an OR gate or an AND gate? It's first time you hear about it, or it's okay. Okay, so you know what are gates. So any circuitry in hardware is really composed of gates, right? And then gates beneath this is really composed of, well, transistors. Again, don't panic. Well, usually if you are into the field, you will cover a lot of transistor stuff in an electronics course, multiple electronic courses, right? But again, this is just giving you the bigger picture. Okay, so another kind of principle that you have to put in mind when you visualize the big picture is you might see multiple views of an, uh, a computing system, right? Uh, this can be, I give you two examples, like mobile phone and laptop or desktop, uh, but there, is, there are also wearables, there are servers, there are uh, smart devices like the, the one we have uh, in front of us uh, right now. There are, in fact, like smart uh, um, kind of VoIP phones, which is the one that we have here, which is also has an embedded processor. You have your router at the phone, and, uh, you have your router at home, which is also kind of an embedded system that really has a computing system uh, inside it, right? So there are multiple views of uh, computers in general, right? So don't kind of have this narrow mindset that it's just a computer is, is only a laptop or a desktop. And in fact, if you inspect them closer, you will find that they are almost exactly the same. They have the same principles, but they are just targeting different consumers. Here I'm giving you two examples from a mobile phone and uh, a laptop. Uh, they look completely different, more or less, but going beneath what is what it looks for a user and looking into the circuitry, you will find that, for example, a mobile phone, uh, this is the system or chip of a, of a phone. It's composed of well, a CPU, a GPU, a memory, I.O. devices, including touch screen or 
or maybe even a mechanical one for old phones. Uh, well, it includes Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, 5G LTE connectivity, all of these are all I.O. devices, right? Uh, and everything is in a system on a chip. And then going to your laptop, well, more or less the same thing. You have I.O. devices, might include an LCD, might include a monitor in a desktop. You also have a keyboard, you have a mouse, which are I.O. devices. You have a CPU. <clears throat> and you have a memory connected to that CPU as part of the motherboard, right? So beneath really what is the, the, the black box, circuitry is more or less the same. We have a central processing unit. We have multiple might be specialized processors, including a GPU or maybe an embedded processor for uh, your Wi-Fi connectivity or your, your uh, LTE connectivity, right? Uh, you might have an accelerator, right? And for example, some of the Google recent phones, right? Dedicated AI accelerators. You might have even a dedicated video processing uh, uh, unit in, in your device, but all of these are nothing other than processors, right? Connecting to some sort of memory to store data and execute programs, right? And they interact with IO devices. So this big picture is exactly the same for everyone, for every device. Look around you in, in, in a wearable, like in this smartwatch, it will be just the same thing, right? I have a touch screen, which is nothing other than like an IO device connected to an beneath system on a chip, which has multiple cores. Again, it might have a GPU, it might have an accelerator, and then you have buttons that, in fact, I.O. devices as well, right? Not much different from the technology perspective than a mouse, right? Uh, and they execute some sort of a task, right? So it might be a good exercise is if you just go home and start thinking about uh, around you what might be an example of a subtle computing system, right? Uh, well, for example, if you think about a car, you might not know that in a car right now, well, I'm not talking about fully autonomous cars or anything. In the cars we have right now in 2022, we have more than 100 CPUs inside the car, right? Uh, and this is just going to increase. 